at all these beautiful women and you want to talk about some big farmer from Muggendorf. I think you have more than a drinking problem, Joe. This pig farmer from Muggendorf was called Hermann Kempf. He was a German intelligence officer and he used to recruit Dutch citizens to spy for him. Hermann Kempf was very costly to the Dutch resistance. I am an artist, hmm? not a Nazi spy. So why did you hide the picture? I didn't hide it. Maybe Johanna did before she left. I don't Kempf know. Kempf shows up at your party. Shortly after, you take payment of 1.6 million guilders from Hermann Goering, far more than even a Vermeer is worth. And why? Uh, because the Nazis are so generous? No, because they're narcissistic. Hitler already had two Vermeers in his collection. Goering wanted to outdo his Führer. He wanted to own the most valuable painting in the world, legitimately, which meant he had to pay for it. Or perhaps you were paid for something more than just the painting. And that's a clip from The Last Vermeer. It stars Guy Pearce, who joins us. Hello, Guy. Good afternoon. Nice to talk to you, sir. Hello, chaps. How are you? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're doing, doing okay. We're doing all right, all things considered. Where are you? Yes. I'm in Amsterdam currently. Oh right, okay. So well, that's 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 most appropriate then, as your movie is clearly, clearly, and very obviously and fantastically shot uh, in Amsterdam. In fact, every second I'm watching this movie, I was thinking I would, I cannot wait to be allowed back uh, to go to do, uh, to go to Amsterdam. Tell us, tell us about the last Vermeer guide, and tell us about the story of Han van Meegeren. Well, we we begin this story by understanding that after the, the war is over, that uh, a number of rather unique paintings, uh, very rare and expensive paintings uh, that have been sold to high level Nazis, uh, being Goering and Hitler, etc., uh, are being retrieved and brought back to their uh, place of origin. And uh, very early in the story, we realise that a this particular man of Han van Meegeren was the, in fact, the uh, um, the art dealer who sold these paintings to these high-level Nazis. So clearly, he is brought to trial very quickly um, for, you know, uh, obvious reasons of traitordom. And so um, uh, Han himself has a uh, seemingly a big secret about these paintings, um, which is uncovered through the course of the film. But he goes from really being uh, you know, quite the uh, quite the demon in the eyes of the uh, of the of the Dutch public to being a bit of a hero, um, without giving too much of the story away. So it's a fascinating story, and Han van Meegeren is is a well known character here in Holland. Um, I wasn't aware of him beforehand, but quite the flamboyant character, but quite a a difficult upbringing, and um, you know we get to see all colours of this uh, of this. Um, you know, colourful character through the course of the film. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> I was just going to mention the book, um, the Jonathan Lopez book, which it comes from. But I'm just wondering if the title of the book is a bit of a spoiler. Are you happy if I mention the name of this book? Um, well, I don't know because <laughs> it is a bit of a spoiler. Yes. It's a tough. It's a tough film to talk about without sort of spoiling it. Okay. So, so okay, maybe give it another title. Okay. So Jonathan Lopez <laughs> wrote a book about this story and your movie is sort of based on that book that's okay that's that, well, i think that's fine uh, yes it's sort of it's sort of based on that book but they but they have actually they have actually looked outside the book uh, for other elements in the story as well so it it does connect to it but it's not specifically based on that book okay so uh, let's talk more about han then who is uh, an aging dandy, I guess you could say, but he's clearly, he has expensive tastes and he is at the start of the movie kind of reveling in the luxury. Can you just explain a bit about that? Because he has an explanation for this. And as you say, it's immediately after the war where uh, in Holland, as in most of Europe, terrible squalor and poverty is most people's lot, but he's lived a fantastic life. Well, that's right. It's and it, and it's just a, a, um, a testament to the to the extreme the extremities of his character, I guess. I mean, he's somebody who, from a very early age, was it was drummed into him by his father that he would amount to nothing, that he was worth nothing, he would be nothing, and he found solace in artwork, in in painting and drawing himself, and very quickly escaped the you know the perils of of, of uh, that life with his father and went off to France and went to art school and, and, and really started to make a, 
a bit of a name for himself. He was considered, you know, he was he was asked to join various artistic societies, etc. And then when he had his sort of first big show in in Holland, um, the critics tore him down and basically said he was nothing but really a hack and and his work was tired and and derivative, which which broke him. I think he I think he had. Um, his, his sort of sights set on uh, a really, um, you know, a pedestal that was probably beyond his, his means. And when it was made apparent to him that he wasn't one of the greats and wasn't going to be one of the greats, um, the humiliation was, was extraordinary for him because I think it took him back to that, that uh, understanding that his father, you know, drilled into him that he was nothing. And so it led then to a, a different path. And that path, you know, partly was about art dealing. So buying and selling paintings. And clearly through that, he was making a lot of money um, through the period of World War II. And I guess beforehand, he ended up owning something like 400 or so um, properties just in Amsterdam alone. So he was, he was living this high life that you, that you reference um, in the face of the, you know, as you say, the, the squalor that the rest of Europe um, uh, was facing. And as if the war wasn't even going on around him, he was, and I think he felt he was owed this because of the humiliation that he'd felt. He, he just didn't feel he deserved to be put back in his box because that box was too painful, I guess. And, you know, he, without again giving too much of the story away, he he started working on um, on forgeries and making money out of those as well. One of the things that we're always told is that if, for for an actor to play a part, they have to find something. And this may not be true, guy, but they have to find something in themselves that is in the character that they're playing. The part that you're playing here is somebody who has been embittered by the sting of criticism and you've had a actually a, a, a very good ride with critics i wonder whether <laughs> there is any part of you that understands that driven by the sting of criticism i understand the sting of criticism absolutely uh i don't i don't necessarily connect to i suppose i do connect to the to the drive that that comes from the sting of criticism but ultimately not to change the path, not to sort of steer it in another direction. Um, I guess ultimately, if, if, if I read a review of my own work and it says Guy wasn't very good, um, I, and, and I agree with that, ultimately it just makes me try harder next time to be good. So, you know, so I understand the stigma of criticism, but, but not to then necessarily kind of find revenge or to, to, to look in other ways to, to um, to sort of better myself. It's, it is just about trying to understand whether that I believe that criticism and, and in actual fact, sometimes I have and I've gone, yeah, they're right. I really wasn't very good or I was really in the wrong movie. You know, I might've been okay at what I was doing but in the balance or the scheme of the film itself I was sort of doing too much or whatever. So I, I get it. Um, but I, it didn't begin for me, you know, as a kid being told I would amount to nothing. I was doing a lot of theatre and having a great time as a kid doing lots of plays and musicals and things. And so, you know, to take a bit of criticism for me was a much easier um, uh, hammer to fall than it was for Hahn von Maker, I think. So, um, you know, so for him, it, 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 yeah, it just, it just turned him inside out, I think. You, I'm interested to know, Guy, what it was, maybe it was just being able to film in Amsterdam that, that won you over and, and being in love with the country. But you do, you pick really interesting projects, it seems to me. And I think I'm right in saying you're one of the only actors who's been in back-to-back -back Oscar winning movies. So you did Hurt Locker and King's Speech. Uh, so you, th there's clearly, some, maybe it's your agent, maybe, I don't know, this, you, 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 pick a, you pick a project. What was it about The Last Vermeer that you thought, yes, this, this is definitely for me? Well, it was a combination of that, that character and that story. And I know that's probably the basic answer I would give to most, you know, films if you ask me about them. But, but, um, but clearly this is a, an intriguing story. 
And uh, it was intriguing also because I was in Holland at the time. I, well, actually, I was in Australia when Ridley, Ridley called me, as Ridley does um, from time to time, uh, as he was a producer, an executive producer on the film. I was in Australia at the time, and but the idea of actually making a film here was interesting to me as well. But even if it was not to be made here, I still would have found the character um, incredibly appealing. You know that the I'm always interested in vulnerability in in characters anyway, um, and <coughs> and how a character deals with their own vulnerability is I find interesting. Um, and for a character like Han van Meijeren, who, as you point out, is living, you know, uh, this sort of the high life and, and is quite the peacock, um, is, is wonderful stuff, is a wonderful tightrope to sort of walk because, you know, you've got to make him appealing to the other characters in the film, but you've also got to make him appealing to an audience. And pe characters who are narcissistic and, and extroverts can be quite annoying, as we know. Um, so, you know, trying to tread that line and, and get the balance right was, was a lovely challenge. And Can I Dan, ask you... Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dan Freakin is the director. I think it's his debut. Um, what, was, what was that like? Because he must be aware that you know, I mean, I know he's a successful producer and so on, but how did he do? What was that like working with the debut director? Well, he, he was lovely, Dan. He really is. And we've remained very good friends, as has um, as have Clays and I. Uh, the three of us got on very well. And Dan was one from the outset. Dan said, look, I just will say, clearly you guys have a lot more experience than me. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I, you know, so he was he was he was he was lovely and uh, full of humility and, um, you know, respect for, for the work that both Clays and I had done. Um, and you know, and I said to Dan, look, absolutely, you don't need to tell us what to do if there's nothing to tell us. But if we're doing something that feels either too much or not enough, or it's in the wrong department, uh, then you must let us know. That's your job as a director. And, you know, Dan's a very successful businessman. And as you point out, he's, he's a producer as well. He's, you know, his film production companies have been behind a couple of films. Um, so he has success in that area too. But, but in, in another world, in a totally sort of separate world uh, of business, he's hugely successful and he's just very good at delegating. You know, so he's, he's very honest, he's very humble, he's very, um, uh, yeah, he's got a great sense of humour and, and um, quite sort of surprising in a way. I mean, I've, met, I've worked with a lot of first-time directors and usually film is the only thing they know and it's and it's they're sort of coming at this as quite a young person and whereas dan as i point out is you know has just come from another world but clearly his passion for film and his desire to sort of get involved in it was palpable and, and really enjoyable to be around to be honest he was lovely yeah i just ask you very quickly one thing um often people say with a character there's a particular thing about them that, that gets them into character in the case of this particular character the two things are head up, chin up, and a hairstyle that starts somewhere on his forehead and goes about a foot behind his head. That is an astonishingly peacocky hair, hairstyle, isn't it? Yes, look, absolutely. And part of, you know, part of the thrill and the joy for me playing any character, if you can, if it's, if it's relevant, is the, is the look, is the, the sort of the, um, the additions, whether it's in costume or makeup, that, 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 that sort of do half of the work for you, you know, that, because they're representative of the person anyway. I mean, the trick I think is to, under, is to remind yourself, is to look in the mirror quite a bit um, when you're dressed like that, because you have to remind yourself that the hair and the makeup is actually doing half of the work for you and that I need to just back off a bit sometimes. I have been known to be a little over the top occasionally <laughs> and, uh, and I was nervous <laughs> with this character that that might happen again. Um, but no, the moustache and the hair and the eyebrows. I mean, let's not forget those. Oh, eyebrows. amazing! Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're terrific. And we should yeah. say that the uh, the Clace you're referring to is Clace Bang, who plays Joseph Peller, who is the uh, resistance fighter uh, investigator uh, who runs the other kind of side uh, of this. Can I uh, can I ask you about the Dutch accent? Uh, guy, because you're immersed in Amsterdam anyway, but, um, and Clace is Danish. Um, is it, did you help him? Did he help you? How difficult is it to get this accent right? 
Well, funnily, I, I find it incredibly difficult. I mean, the film that I met Carice on, I was playing a, a Dutch character speaking English. And so that was where I really, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't say that's where I learnt the Dutch accent, but that was my first foray into, you know, trying to, um, you know, trying to tackle it. This was back in 2015 doing Brimstone. I mean, it's a, I find it a very difficult accent. And, and, and when we were doing Brimstone, every day the director would say something to me. He'd either say, oh, you sound Swedish today or you sound <laughs> Scottish today. You sound like you're from Cape Town. <laughs> so that was, it was tough. But by the time... <laughs> By the time we did this film, you know, I was almost like dance captain. I was sort of, you know, I'd had a bit of experience here compared to some of the other English actors or Clace, et cetera. And Carice was helping as well. I would sort of sit down with Carice and say, just record into this microphone how you would say the, the Goudsticker Gallery, would you, or whatever. Um, and uh, so, so I would get tips from her. And then occasionally on set, I would be saying to the other actors, oh, I think you would pronounce that, uh, you know, like this or it's more that sound not that i'm any expert but you know i did have a little bit of experience uh guy it sounds as though someone needs you just just before you go what, what do the best um, you've ever heard yeah 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 no no uh, absolutely uh, are, are you about to go off and uh, and film again how is um are you gonna are you being let out how does how does it feel at the moment what's what's next for you well, I actually, I've just returned from Australia. I went to Australia in November to do our final season of Jack Irish um, uh, after, you know, about 10 years of doing that every sort of second year. Uh, so it was great to get back to Australia. First time I'd been back there in about two years. Um, so I've only just returned from Australia um, and I'm looking at jobs now and seeing what's available and what's possible and, you know, what the restrictions are as far as sort of if I go somewhere to do a film in the UK or in Europe somewhere, whether I'm allowed back into Holland afterwards. Mm. Of course, I have my little four-year-old boy here, so I don't want to be locked out. Um, so it's a tricky time figuring that stuff out. Um, but I'm you know, in the process. So hopefully I'll find something decent soon. All right. Uh, Guy Pierce, very nice to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Good to talk to you guys.